Hey guys, I think I'm live. Can people hear me? Let's see some hands. No, I'm kidding. Sorry. Thanks a lot for coming uh, and joining our latest episode of Surge Decoded uh, with me, Anandamoy Roy Chaudhary, otherwise just called Roy. Uh, I've been here at Sequoia now for about eight years. And, uh, you know, I've worked a fair bit with our portfolio companies around helping them, you know, sort of set up their engineering teams, uh, you know, do some product work, etc. And I've learned a few things along the way. And I thought, you know, one of the things is, uh, you know, we get a lot of questions uh, from the folks uh, who apply to Surge about, you know, what, how we should be thinking about uh, engineering related stuff. So I thought, hey, why not spend some time, you know, answer some questions. Uh, so we had some folks send in some questions in advance, but you know, if there's something that you that occurs to you right now and you'd like to ask it, you know, feel free to type it in. Uh, we're live on YouTube, we're live on Instagram, we're live on Facebook, we're live on some tech we can't even discuss because it's high secret. All of that stuff's going on here. It's very exciting, very busy. All right, so I'm gonna jump into the questions. Uh, the first one, I'm searching for a tech co-founder from so long and still searching only stuck at tech partners. Where can I find a tech co-founder? This is a question from Yogesh Mahale. Yogesh, this is a very good question. And unfortunately, a very important one in the sense that, you know, your co-founder is make or break, right? If you think about the fact that so many of startups tend to not do well, primarily because the co-founders, you know, kind of lose steam and fight and things of that nature, right? And so it's not just where can I find a tech co-founder, but where can I find someone that I can work with, you know, for a long period of time. And there's lots of ways to do this. I think, you know, one of the best things to do is to reach into your own sort of network as much as you can. Uh, it's very helpful uh, to try to find people who really care about, uh, you know, about what you're doing and, uh, you know, building it off from that perspective. It's super hard if you meet somebody new uh, to have that level of sort of, uh, you know, mind meld in order to sort of build a company together. So this is a hard one to, you know, to pull off uh, with a real absolute stranger. So, you know, uh, your past networks, your past professional networks, having some level of shared experiences, even if it's just, hey, we were in college together and things like that, uh, really help in sort of, you know, building that rapport that you need uh, to keep it going with a tech co-founder. So, you know, that's my answer to that. Uh, the second question, proprietary technology and data are often competitive modes for a B2B SaaS startup. But in the early stages, products are taking shape and the company is limited by resources, right? So when pitching to investors, how should founders portray their strategy for building technology and data as long-term competitive advantages? This is a question from Akash Mohan. An excellent, excellent question. Okay, so two things, right? I think that, you know, this is very important. The whole concept that in order to have a data advantage, you need a set of users to actually use the product, right? Uh, I think it's useful to articulate that and not claim that you have it on day one or when you only have 10 users of the product, right? So I think that, you know, that's the thing that you should keep in mind is never overclaim what is possible uh, with the tech that you've built, right? At the same time, you know, we know that this naturally emerges from working with, you know, more customers, et cetera. And so what we are often looking for upfront is, What's your wedge, right? Why are you useful to your customers? Because if you can build something that people can use and they get some value from it and, uh, and you know, and that's the way you will sort of get usage, then the ability to sort of build a data advantage over a period of time is fine, you know? There are a, there are a set of companies to which this doesn't apply, right? You know, for example, there was a search company that was built data first, right? And one of the big things they had to do was go acquire some data advantages because they couldn't really operate without having a large amount of data because this was a, you know, this was an AI uh, prediction company that worked on sort of, you know, helping you make better personal finance decisions. And so it wasn't useful till you didn't actually have the data. And so in that case, acquiring data was part of their strategy upfront and something that we sort of evaluated together before making the investment. But for the vast majority of like, you know, more procedural SaaS companies, it's okay for the data advantages to show up in act two and act three. That's that's perfectly fine. As long as you articulate it like that, uh, you know, it works well. What is the best measure for engineering team outcome focused productivity, which can help the non-tech leadership be on the same page? This is a question from Jayan Chauhan. Again, excellent, 
excellent excellent question so two two things right uh, you know we we've, we've put out some material on okrs but if you don't know what an okr is you should definitely go read up on it the okr is perhaps the best way that you can build alignment across tech and non tech teams about what is it that we're trying to achieve as an organization right and if you do your okrs well which means that they're actually focused on results and not on activities you should have very good alignment on what is possible right and then if you have very good alignment on what is possible and what is to be achieved uh the second thing you do is you have to incentivize your engineering teams to focus on outcomes and not on activities you know one easy hack right like what do you do when an engineer actually finishes his work ahead of schedule right are you the person who gives them oh you finished a day ahead let me give you something more to do or do you actually give them a day off and tell them hey why don't you use this time to go do something else or learn something else or spend some time writing a patent presentation or something of that on those lines so that they can add value to their career do something productive but they aren't in a sense penalized for finishing early by getting more work to do right if you think about it like that you'll be surprised that if you can build some alignment from a non tech and tech perspective that these are the outcomes that matter and uh, we would love for you to finish early and if you finish ahead of time you know there's actually there's real sort of meaningful rewards you'd be surprised at how easy it is to build alignment actually so good question jayant i hope that answer works for you uh fourth question how does a startup founder look to build technology around product and services if he or she is not from an engineering or technical background this is a question from vikram singh and again very good question we get this a lot right see there are companies that build tech and then there are companies that are starting that are more focused on business model innovation the one thing to keep in mind and you know i don't think a lot of companies in india and southeast asia have necessarily internalized this that in the year 2021 so much tech is actually being built by other companies that you can just use to solve the problems that you need to solve right you know the amount of effort it took to get a startup off the ground even 10 years ago vv now is orders of magnitude different right it's just become so much more efficient right and so i'd say the same thing to you vikram which is use the tools right you know if you haven't seen something called retool go look at it right and you know you'll be surprised at how much you could build using no code tools like that uh that can make you much more effective uh you know if you want to build a jam stack based website there are sort of designers for that you know this web flow there's lots and lots of interesting products and services out there uh there is actually there is always going to be more code to write and you always going to need engineers right so i don't think there's a situation you end up in when there are no engineers but you can absolutely get a lot more done today with just the design tools that exist that you could have done even 5 years ago so you know this this thing is going to become less and less important over a period of time because you should look at the tools and then use the tools and then build on those tools yeah So that's my answer Vikram I hope that helped We don't have tech capabilities in house our business is based on furniture how do we go about building the tech for this Gaurav Kulreshth Kul So Gaurav again similar to what I just said for the previous uh, question uh really look into the tools that are being built that allow people like you to sort of build the stuff that you need right you don't have to write and start writing a ton of code anymore to build you know usable product you just have to use the latest and the greatest and the best tools uh and pick up from that and so you know uh so yeah that's what i would do everybody go look at retool it's very useful go look at airtable go look at notion right very nice tools being built that can allow us to build a lot of the tech that we need much more easily than in the past right right we got more questions for you oh excellent right. i believe this is uh these are questions coming from instagram one of them is from my mother i'm not getting married next no. one Okay, so this is from Paragon. Uh, how much progress should a company or project have made to make it to stand a chance for a place of surge? Excellent question. Uh, so two things, right? You know, surge is meant for early stage, and the way to think about that this is that it is never too early to apply to surge. It is never too early to talk to someone at surge, right? Having said that, you know, when you think about how many people apply and how many people get in. you know it's pretty clear that there are filters that we apply on the kinds of companies that we look to invest in and you know and so to the degree that there is traction and there is uh real momentum either on customer side or on consumer usage or things of that nature all of that stuff is going to help your cause right so you know you should absolutely 
think about this not so much from an applying to search perspective but from your own perspective which is hey man i've got to you know i've got something to build i've got all these risks what are the risks that i can take out of the system before i go and try to get you know before i approach someone to get some money right you know if you're going to build let's say a b2b ledger system it would be useful to have 100 people using that ledger before you showed up now 100 is not a fixed number right it could be 5 it could be 500 you know the real numbers really depend on what you're building and and what that situation's like uh but it's useful to have real world uh data about what you're building you know i believe it was mohammad ali who said this i don't actually i don't know if it was mohammad ali i don't know who said it but you know there's this thought that says that you know, there is no perfect plan ever survives first contact with the enemy right and so i think that's very important when you're thinking about startups which is you can plan and you can plan and you can plan but till you don't have something that you've put out in the real world you're never really going to know if what you're building is right or wrong or right or wrong right and so try to get that as early as you can and the more of that that you have the easier it is to apply it so the easier it is for us to evaluate uh whether what you're building you know uh is something that we can sort of help with and help you grow into a much larger business all right uh jay has a question around the decision decision for startups a lot of startups uh a lot of startups are thinking about the buying building versus partnering question uh can you maybe elaborate a bit on that when should startups build something in themselves when should they buy something from outside or when should they partner okay so this is very good i think see there are two parts to this right the fact of the matter is that it's very hard to buy something when capital is constrained but most companies completely misunderstand what it takes to actually build something and so you're much better off buying or partnering uh till you get to the point where what you're building uh absolutely has to be built by yourself and that's usually something that has to do with the core advantage or the core business that you're working on until you don't have that uh pretty much everything else you should try to buy build a partner All right, we have a question from YouTube, and this one is about you know, does Sequoia have any preference for what basic, basic tech stack that is preferred? You know, from back end, from front end, you know, what are some best practices? Yeah, hey, we have no preferences on any of this stuff because the reality is that the tech stack is a function of the business that you're trying to build and the company that you're trying to build and the problems you're trying to solve, right? So, you know. It, the one sort of general guideline we give people is that you know you should try to pick tech stacks that make it possible for you to hire engineers and scale fast especially on the people side of things uh and you know to that degree picking esoteric tech stacks can sometimes hurt you but you know it's always a function of what you're building right you know uh actually very recently we did a surge investment in a company that has a dot net architecture in the background in the back end and that's very rare but you know was the right answer for what they were doing and so you know we've done that sort of investment as well so very very uh, very specific, very focused on the problem that you're actually trying to solve and not so much you know we don't really have a point of view yes and then there's another question from youtube how much time and cost it will take to build an mvp for a tech driven idea i don't know man this is a tough one because you know it can take you a day it can take you a year uh take your decade it really depends on what you're trying to do uh i think the question is always that you know you want to do this quicker rather than later right you know there are certain types of problems and there are certain types of things that you're building when you have significant amount of domain expertise and so what you're doing is you're you know you can take a year you can take two years to build an mvp because you just happen to know with a lot of detail what it is that you're doing but if you don't know something at that level of detail you're always better off being faster rather than slower right and so while i don't have an exact number for you i can tell you that sooner is always the right answer right there's a question from instagram this one is from muna warala muna warala thanks so much for asking so if there is a large problem with large enough market size you know what are some of the next questions somebody uh, would ask themselves before delving further into the idea and applying to something uh, to some kind of program like search again uh, that's a that's a very very good thought right so two things i think the most important thing is exactly right is that you know how large is the market i think the second thing we look for that you would look for is you know why am i sort of uniquely positioned to be the person solving this problem right what specific 
insights do I have uh, compared to other people that make it possible for me to, you know, really sort of find an answer to this question. I think that's the second thing that you should think about. And then, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, if you've had an insight and a lot of other people have had the insight uh, and there's lots of people who already built something in the space, you have to ask yourself why what you're saying and what you're going to build is maybe 10x better, right? Uh, very often you see people who are, who have a solution that's maybe 20% better. And the problem with that is that it's very hard to win because people, you know, the incumbents tend to catch up very quickly. So you definitely need to have orders of magnitude, uh, better sort of solutioning in mind if you're going to build a startup that's competing against an existing company. The good news is not that hard because, you know, let's face it, most software that's built today uh, can be radically improved quite easily. And so I'm hoping that a bunch of you on this call are trying to do that. Yeah, we have another question from YouTube. Romel Ligani is asking, what can founders expect in terms of tech when they join search? What kind of tech audit uh, should they expect? I'm not a big fan of the word, phrase tech audit, right? Because that, that makes it seem like, hey, you know, we know something that you don't. Uh, what we look for is two things, right? Like what we look for is often is just common sense, right? Like, do you know how to make good decisions on how to use technology? Are you building the right things? Uh, you know, and also that's, you know, that's also generally a function of how tech oriented that specific company is, right? Like if you're talking about a dev tools company, then we will absolutely spend a lot of time thinking about the tech and looking at how you're building it. But if you're building something that's more business model innovation, uh, you know, manage marketplace, that sort of thing, then, you know, the reality is that, you know, even if you've made some mistakes on the tech side, that can be fixed later. Uh, so, you know, that's how that works. Now, you know, we have people in surge, you know, I'm one of them. Uh, you know, I've, I've been around now 25, 30 years as a professional. You know, when you live that long and you, you spend that much time, you can't help but learn a few things. And, you know, I try to share that knowledge with the folks who join search, sometimes against their will. Uh, and, you know, they're all sort of, you know, and we hope that they learn something from that and, you know, do something with that. And so uh, we also try to, you know, help you connect with CTOs in uh, our portfolio companies, right? And they can give you a point of view, often as of early customer. And, you know, that's very helpful to people, right? Which is like, hey, like, let's say you're building something in DevTools. Uh, you know, the other companies around you are actually your best customers, right? And they, uh, they will understand uh, why what you're building is useful or not. And so, you know, we help sort of facilitate those conversations. Uh, we help sometimes bring these CTOs to work with you, mentor you. Uh, you know, some of them have, uh, you know, gone on to make seed investments in some of our search companies so that they can work more closely with them. Uh, so there's actually a lot of structured sort of technology help that we do, both on the people side, but also on the tech and architecture and tech stack side. Right. So Sean Mazel is asking, uh, you're probably going to be the last question. We know that you know we're kind of like limited on time, but he's asking, you know, what is the hiring criteria for an engineer for an early stage or pre-release product with you know some level of MVP? Ah, uh, okay, tough for me to answer. I think you know again, there's a very wide variance, right? There are some companies that are just happy to work with someone uh, at that stage, and so they'll hire pretty much anybody. And then some companies, because the first few hires are are very sort of uh, make or break. They tend to have very high standards in the beginning, right? So it really depends on on the founders and the company and what they want to do. Uh, but the general sort of thing that will make you stand out as a great candidate is that, you know, if you show a disproportionate amount of interest in the problem itself, and so you're not just looking at it from a job, but you actually show that, hey, I want to work in an early stage company, that's important to me, and, you know, and try to really understand what is being built there, I think that will give you, again, a disproportionate unfair advantage over the other candidates who are applying. Uh, being an early stage engineer is perhaps one of the most rewarding things you can do as an engineer. You get to make lots of big decisions early. And so it's a very exciting uh, place to be. And if you want to work at any of our search companies, they're all hiring engineers. Uh, you know, please feel, free to, uh, please feel free to reach out to them uh, and see if you can sort of work with them. That would be amazing. I think that's it. All right. Thank you so much, Roy, for taking time to chat with us. No, thank you very much for having me. And thank you to all the 100 odd people who've listened in. This is pretty amazing. Thank you. We should do this again. Thank you. Bye. Right. Thanks, Roy. Thanks, Roy.